Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for the Waltham Land Trust's Green Possibilities Forum for City Council candidates. As you may know, the Waltham Land Trust is a nonprofit organization that serves to protect and maintain Waltham's green spaces and to advocate for conservation concerns in the city. We have over 350 members and 250 stewards who help with trail maintenance and invasive plant removal. We're excited to host this forum to provide candidates with an opportunity to share their views about environmental topics with the voting public. Though we tried to schedule dates that worked for all candidates, not all could make it, and some will be submitting written responses, which, which we'll post to our website along with the forum videos. My name is Dan Berlin, and I'll be tonight's moderator. I'm the board chair of the Land Trust, proprietor of Watch City Research, and a PhD student at Bentley University. Finally, it's important for us to mention that the Waltham Land Trust is a nonpartisan organization, which has organized these forums to provide Waltham voters with an opportunity to hear from the candidates about green issues. The Waltham Land Trust does not and will not endorse candidates for political office. Membership in the Land Trust or participation in this forum or any other events hosted by the Land Trust is not an endorsement of any candidate. And with that, we will turn it to uh, our introductions. Uh, and we um, uh, will start with um, John McLaughlin. Can you hear me all right, Dan? Yes. Great. Can you see me all right? You can. <laughs> so um, I want to um, thank the Land Trust for this opportunity um, to speak to everyone tonight. Um, I have the privilege of serving on the Waltham City Council representing Ward 4. Um, I've served uh, on the council um, for a number of terms and have been in leadership uh, in one form or another over that time. I currently serve on the uh, Ordinance and Rules Committee, um, the Veteran Services Committee, and the License and Franchise Committee. I also serve as the chair of the Committee of the Whole and um, um, by way of that, um, the vice president of the council. I also uh, am involved uh, by way of my work with the council with the Massachusetts Municipal Association. Um, I am currently the vice president of that organization. Um, that gives us insight um, through their work with the state um, that helps me do my job with the city. I'm also president of the Massachusetts Councilors Association and also uh, was selected by um, by Governor Healy, uh, uh, reappointed by Governor Healy um, to um, serve on the LGAC, the Local Government Advisory Commission. Um, I think I'm out of time. <laughs> Great, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Robert Logan. Hi, my name is Robert Logan and I'm a candidate for Counselor Award 9. I've been a lifelong environmentalist, uh, going all the way back to my years at Waltham High School, where I was the leader of the Ecology Club and was um, named Environmentalist of the Year. More recently, I served for many years in the Waltham City Council, where I was always a strong advocate for open space and the environment. I supported the acquisition of the UMass Field Station on Beaver Street. Here is what I told the Waltham Land Trust in their questionnaire in 2019. Quote, my vision for the future of that property is to have all the organizations now there just keep doing what they are doing. And all planning for that property must be collaborative and involve all stakeholders. I would also note that I'm a longtime member of the Waltham Land Trust and a volunteer trail steward. You can learn more about my campaign at Logan for Ward9.org. And I would appreciate your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Eamon Dawes. Hi, everyone. My name is Eamon Dawes, and I'm running for the Ward 9 City Council seat. Uh, a big thank you to Dan and the whole Waltham Land Trust for putting together this event um, and really giving all of our neighbors an opportunity to hear where us candidates stand on conservation and the environment. Um, I'm a first time candidate, but even before this year, I got into politics through climate activism, you know, advocating for environmentally sustainable neighborhoods through green transportation, energy and housing options. And, you know, and we have some great natural resources here in Ward 9, like the river, but we also have far less green space than the rest of the city. Um, so we need to protect what we have and expand it where possible. Um, you know, 
although we're not like Prospect Hill, we're not like Beaver Brook, I think that our uh, position in the city gives us, you know, uh, even greater opportunity to make a big difference, um, making sure that we can have, you know, ensure that trees remain in development, um, you know, ensure that we can build um, environmentally sustainable, um, you know, infrastructure. I think it's all very important. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have, we will hear from Bill Hanley. Um, hello, Waltham, and uh, hello to my neighbors in Ward 3. I'm Bill Hanley, and I want to represent you as the next Ward 3 city councilor. I think my leadership and management experience will make me a productive and accessible city councilor. Uh, my parents bought their first home on Seminole Ave in Ward 3, and I took advantage of everything Waltham had to offer. Graduated Waltham High in 92 and Purdue University in 1996. I'm the proud husband of Christy Hanley, the library teacher at Whittemore Elementary School. Uh, our son, Billy, graduated from Waltham High with the class of 22, and our son, Michael, is a senior there now. Uh, professionally, I've worked for Mass General Brigham for the last uh, 25 years, leading a team of software developers working to improve patient safety. Um, I think with the award three vote, I'll bring common sense decisions and local solutions to the city council, and I ask for your award three vote. Uh, thanks for listening, and thank you for the to the Land Trust for hosting this forum. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be we'll hear from Robert Davis. Uh, thank you, for Dan. Thanks for holding this. And uh, my name is Robert Davis. I'm running for Ward Seven. Uh, I've been in Ward Seven my whole life. Grew up here over on Fisk, now I'm over on Andrea, and uh, right next to Nippemar Parks, which is uh, one of the biggest parks in the city, which is great to have. I have a three, five, and 11-year-old. Um, so having these big open spaces is definitely convenient for, for kids, which I, I like to see. Um, again, uh, I just like to really touch on that we definitely need better parks. Um, we we we're definitely getting there um, with the Fernald School. Hopefully something turns around with that. Um, I like what the forestry division has with planting trees for residents that ask for it. Uh, I think we need to expand on that. So uh, with that being said, um, hopefully we move forward and we can uh, make this a, a definitely a greener city. Thank you. Okay, we are up to the questions and we'll have the same order uh, for response for, for question one. Uh, I will read each question just once and then go through each candidate. In the coming years, the MWRA will be digging a new tunnel through Waltham and building infrastructure at Lawrence Meadow, the property owned by the University of Massachusetts on Beaver Street. What are the opportunities to use the $2 million set aside for the cleanup of Lawrence Meadow and to ensure that this important wetlands area is protected, cleaned up, and made useful to the, to the public in the future? And we'll start with... John McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Dan. And I, I didn't practice my opening, so I'm going to be shot um, if I don't mention my wife and my three kids. Uh, we've been in Waltham for over 25 years and um, um, and love living in the city. Um, this particular project is obviously something that doesn't just affect Waltham, it affects the region. Uh, it's something that's not going to be done overnight. Um, I believe... Um, the, the fact that this is going to touch um, the UMass wetlands um, uh, that are at Beaver and Waverly Oaks uh, is, is, is very important. When we were negotiating the purchase of the property, um, one of the things that we didn't want to take from UMass or purchase from them is the liability uh, involved with that particular piece of property. The fact that the MWRA, who is in the business of clean water and providing drinking water, the fact that um, that's gonna touch this particular area, I think is great. Um, that the, the fault um, of the contamination on the property lies both with UMass, with experiments that had been done over the years with fly ash, and also, when you look to the north side of the property with the Fernald, uh, the power station, is, as everyone knows, is on that back section that abuts uh, the wetlands. And, um, you know, there's been contamination over the years that's come down off the hillside. So the fact that uh, the MWRA, MWRA is going to um, 
be involved with um, uh, this major project uh, that's going to touch on on um, that wetlands, I think is great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Robert Logan. Yeah, the Lawrence Meadow was not acquired by the city of Waltham when it bought the UMass Field Station. So the state still owns it. But it's my understanding that as part of the deal, the state, uh, with the state, the city agreed to set aside $2 million for the cleanup of the Lawrence Meadow, which was contaminated as a result of agricultural experiments conducted there years ago. Um, now, the, MBT, the uh, MWRA is going to be installing one of the vertical shafts for its Metropolitan Water Tunnel Program there. And although this is state land, the Waltham community has an interest in seeing contamination uh, remediated at this site and that the wetland be preserved, uh, pre you know, re restored and preserved. As a city councilor, I would insist that the remediation be completed before the work to dig the vertical shaft was commenced, or at the very least that the MWRA engineers provide proof to us that the work in the vertical shaft would not disrupt the contamination cause it to spread or to make remediation more difficult in the future. And in any case, I would push for remediation uh, of the contamination to take place as quickly as possible so that that uh, site can be restored and, uh, and it can be a, a natural resource for the city. Thank you. So we'll hear from Eamon Doss. Yes, thanks, Dan. Um, thank you for flagging this project. I know there's been a few uh, MWRA projects in the city uh, presently, uh, so being able to get a bit of foresight into what's coming next is certainly helpful. Um, you know, when I look at this, I, I look to the, the last few words in the question, how can we make it useful to the public? Um, and really, this land is useful to the public as um, flood water storage, storm water storage um, from Clematis Brook. Uh, you know, it's useful in the sense that it's, you know, providing an ecosystem to, you know, all the species that live in these wetlands, which are, you know, wetlands are rare in Waltham. So as we look at toward the opportunities uh, to do any remediation, uh, you know, those really need to be the goals we have in mind. You know, how can we use this as a part of our um, sort of larger flood infrastructure, green infrastructure, um, and making sure that it's a resilient ecosystem for uh, all the species that call it home. Um, I, I would not be surprised, I think, as along with many folks in this call, you know, if there is contamination in that area, um, you know, we've cleaned up contamination in the, on the field station and in the Fernald just in the past few years. Um, so I think it, it's no surprise that we have some of it there. Um, and I think, you know, making that a um, requirement uh, and prerequisite, prerequisite for, um, you know, any development, um, any tunneling, any work um, is very important. I know, especially with the uh, field station, we've seen, you know, what, what happens when we push uh, contamination remediation, you know, further along down the timeline uh, than many people would like. Um, so I think that it's a uh, great that this, uh, both the infrastructure project and, you know, and this uh, wetland in Waltham can be highlighted um, and bring some attention about to it. Um, and I just think that we have to make sure that it can remain a, a useful environmental uh, habitat. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Bill Hanley. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, $2 million is quite a bit of money, uh, but it doesn't really seem to uh, be enough. I, I I was surprised it was that amount of money. I, I think first and foremost, the funding has to go to prioritize the cleanup of the area, get it to a safe state, especially after construction of that uh, shaft for that tunnel. Um, I read that MWRA doesn't anticipate any negative effects of that construction, but you know that gets me skeptical. Uh, just the size of that overall tunnel project is unbelievable. Um, there's really no public access to that land now. I drove by. Um, before this question in my research, I just thought it was part of the Fernal property. But uh, even though it's state land, it's still in Waltham. And I think the taxpayers uh, are entitled to some benefit of that land too. Um, obviously as wetlands, I don't know, you know, that it could ever be used for public use. Um, but I'd love to see it made usable, um, back to its original state, especially considering all the, uh, coming construction, 
uh, at the Fernald. So I think it's going to be a, something everyone's going to have to keep an eye on for a while. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Robert Davis. <clears throat> Thank you again. Um, I mean, the project is going to be a, definitely a big project. Uh, the $2 million definitely seems like a small change compared to what we need uh, to make sure that it's, it's, um, it's finished to completion to where it needs to be for that tunnel. Um, with that being said, again, $2 million is, is, is not much that we can do with, especially when some of the streets that we have being done over cost over a million dollars that are small street additions um, and fixing and, and drainage and stuff. So the $2 million, hopefully we can really stretch it to what we need to do. Um, it's definitely going to be a planning board that needs to sit and really uh, work as a team to, um, to get it to, to, to work. Um, but that the, the property definitely needs to be cleaned up. Obviously it's been contaminated for a long period of time. Um, luckily, the MWRA is definitely stepping up, and uh, hopefully we can get something accomplished. But again, the $2 million is definitely going to be just a small amount that we need to make sure that we can keep it the way it is, and hopefully it can stay that way. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to question two. Thank you to the candidates for your uh, great answers to question one. Question two. Very few of the open spaces in Waltham are protected from future, develop, future development. What is your plan for ensuring that land designated as public open space, such as land purchased with CPA funds, is permanently protected from future development, such as with conservation restriction? And we'll start with Mr. Davis. Sorry, thanks. Um... So Waltham needs a planning board. Uh, we have a master plan, which is run by the candidates uh, for the work counselors. Uh, we really need a planning board to really determine what we can do with the land that we have, the future of the city, um, and really get a good direction for us to go in. Right, right now, it, there, there is no plan. Um, and hopefully, we can get a, a board together um, to, really, to really put these conservation areas, these green spaces, these parks, additional parks, um, and, and really get a direction for the city. And that's that's my overall goal, hopefully, to see. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Mr. McLaughlin. Thanks, Dan. You got me guessing when we're going to be up up to bat. Um, so I'm trying to be quick with my um, my finger work here. So um, some of my proudest moments on the council has involved open space and open space preservation. Uh, when I first came on board, I was very pleased to be involved with um, the purchase of the Fernal property from the state. Um, I think I said that that night, uh, the most important part of that is we are in control of what happens at Fernald. I have no doubt in my mind that had we not purchased it, it would have been developed in a way that would have been detrimental um, to the neighborhood. Um, uh, you know, some of the other um, uh, other purchases that we've had a Regal farm on Warren Street, which is the location of um, the city's tree farm right now. Um, we just secured some additional dollars to repair the buildings on the property, uh, but that was another um, another great uh, win for the city because um, you know that that particular piece of property could have also been developed. And um, although not as dense as the uh, as the south side, um, you know, um, putting up um, uh, buildings in that in that area, which has been a farm since the 1600s, would have been a sin. Um, and then more recently, the purchase of the field station. Um, the council had uh, selected me to join the mayor and um, uh, city solicitor Stanton in the negotiations with UMass. And I was very, very happy that we were able to get the job done on that and that we're preserving not only open space, but also agriculture. Um, I think that one of the ways that we can protect this long term is with conservation restrictions. I do think we need to look at each one individually uh, because of the needs of the city. Um, but again, I, I am very proud of the work that I've done with regard to preserving open space in the city. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we'll hear from Robert Logan. Okay. So uh, as you probably know, Section 12A of the Community Preservation Act requires that a permanent restriction be placed on any property acquired using CPA funds to ensure that the property uh, continues to be used for you know, appropriate CPA purposes. But this requirement has not always been complied with in Waltham, and I would make sure that it is and more. I would introduce a resolution to have the city council review the status of all city owned land that was acquired for conservation or open space, including all such lands that were purchased using CPA funds to determine which have been placed under a conservation restriction and which have not. And then I'd push to have all of those lands not yet protected be placed under a conservation restriction duly recorded at the registry of deeds. We've seen before that Article 97 of the state constitution doesn't always protect vacant land owned by municipalities from being used for purposes other than open space. So we must act to ensure that all of our lands that were required for, for uh, conservation or open space are in fact never diverted to some other use. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Eamon Dawes. Yeah, this is absolutely clear cut in mass general law that, you know, especially for anything with CPA funding, uh, you know, it needs to have a conservation restriction. Um, I have seen in the uh, a flurry of conservation restrictions recently come across uh, the docket in city council. Um, so I know uh, the backlog, so to say, is being addressed, um, but it's something that's slipped through the cracks. And I think that we need to have a, you know, more modern process in, you know, city hall when purchasing new parcels um, and a way to audit uh, the existing ones. Um, I think that well, lots of things are done sort of uh, pen and paper or photocopies um, and being able to um, sort of modernize, digitize, automate where we can, um, you know, it can really help prevent this happening in the future. Um, and it's not only the CPA parcels that we can put conservation restrictions are on, um, but other, you know, parks and open spaces uh, that we have in the city that we want to make sure, you know, can stay for the public use. Um, you know, we need to pursue uh, conservation restrictions on those as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Bill Hanley. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in Ward 3, we're spoiled with a lot of open green space. Um, most of it uh, acquired from the, from the state. We also have some DCR green space. So uh, selfishly, it's a big reason Ward 3 is a, a desirable place to live. Um, but as far as conservation recreation res restrictions, I know it's a tough subject. Um, it's hard to, to think so far ahead, but I, I would love to see these restrictions put in place. Uh, same as what some of the previous uh, candidates have mentioned. Um, they have the potential to restrict land we might need in the future, but even with that in mind, uh, any open space in Ward 3, uh, CPA acquired or others, I fully support uh, conservation recreation restrictions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to question three. And again, thank you to the candidates for your answers so far. For question three, we are lucky to have many green spaces in Waltham, but there's a particular lack of it in the densely populated south side of area, south side area of Waltham. How could the city bring green space to this area? And we will start with Mr. Hanley. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, the south side certainly... Uh much more dense housing wise compared to the, the north side. Seems that uh, housing density is being targeted a bit more than, than open space, but um, you know, there are definitely some projects going on right now. Um, you know, planned demolition of the Fitch School to create a park. That's a step in the right direction, uh, really close to the river, the watch factory. I think that's gonna add um, quite a bit of, uh, of amenities to that area. Uh, my wife and I actually rented an apartment near there on Robin Street before we bought our house. And, and we still comment how there is a lack of uh, places to go in that area. Uh, Contusion Park being expanded by about 11 acres, including some dog parks and other trails and 
uh, sport sporting uh, courts and and additional parking, something for everyone. Uh, it's, it's hung up in in some bureaucracy right now, but I think that's a great example of uh, reclaiming old. I think it was an old dump and creating some green space on the south side. Uh, I fully support that. I think that's going to be a gem in the, in the south side. And then Logan Park needs a refresh. I think that's being looked at as well for a refurbishment. Um, and then speaking of that area out on the island, uh, the old Camp Forest Grove, which is currently uh, DCR land, uh, always took my kids fishing there and, and hiking. Uh, there's already trails, fishing spots, and some parking. So that that's some grease space that's uh, underused. I'm happy to see all that. Thank you. Thank you. So that would be Mr. Davis. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, so, um, a lot of construction going on in the city of Waltham. Uh, a lot of upgrades. A lot of things are changing. Definitely, um, you see a lot of places being torn down and, and, and added to. I think we need to have, you know, a plan set for more trees. The forestry department, again, has a great program that, you know, you can call up and get a tree planted if it's available and you're, you, you can get that in. Um, so these new construction sites, definitely commercial sites that we have going on up on Fifth Ave, uh, First Ave, the plan there, you know, they want to put 400,000 square foot buildings in for research and development. We definitely need to have more open spaces for people to get outside. Uh, they're making accommodations for bikes and electric cars and all that. But again, I think they really need to make sure that we keep up with it and make sure that they have open spaces um, and places to be out um, to get people outside more and to have open areas. Uh, previously, that was just mentioned, uh, the old fishing pond, the fishing island out there. I, I went out there when I was a kid. Um, it, it's just that there's a lot, of, a lot of areas that can improve, but the dense areas are tough. Um, especially if there's anything that's being, you know, from these developers being torn down and built back up that, you know, they need to make space to make sure that they have some green areas and, you know, bring some trees back into the city. So it's not just a concrete, um, utopia. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Mr. McLaughlin. promise I'll get faster with this, Dan. No um, so, um, yeah, I mean, the South side, it's, as I mentioned uh, in the last question, uh, much more dense um, than the North side. Uh, I think we, the council, the city has been aggressive um, in pre preservation of open space. Um, and I think we need to have the same effort on the South side. Um, uh, a couple of the councils have mentioned some of the other projects that are going on. Yeah, the Fitch uh, School property redevelopment will include um, uh, open space. I think that's that's very important. It would have been very easy to, you know, go in and, um, you know, not very easy, but it would have been um, an option to develop the whole property, and that's not going to happen. Uh, Contusion Park, um, that work that's being done to clean up that area to uh, to expand the park, I think is key. As those opportunities present, present themselves, um, I think um, we've got uh, an appetite to continue to do that. Um, a lot of times people talk about pocket parks, which again are great, um, but if we can uh, look to see as property becomes available uh, to see if the city can step in um, and even create new open space on the south side. And that's going to be hard because property is very, very valuable on the south side. But um, that's something that I would um, I would absolutely support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Mr. Logan. Thank you. Um, of course, as a salt, uh, lifelong salt side resident, I'm certainly uh, uh, sensitive to this issue. Uh, the lack of open space and trees on the south side causes it to be an urban heat island. Uh, this <clears throat> negatively affects the quality of life in the neighborhood, obviously, and the health of its residents, and it's got to be addressed. During my tenure on the Waltham City Council, the city of Waltham acquired numerous parcels for preservation and open space 
totaling over 389 acres of land. Of course, <clears throat> I supported every one of those acquisitions, but uh, recognizing that none of that land was on the south side, I led the effort to acquire a portion of an abandoned railroad line, the old Watertown branch that ran right through the south side. And I led the effort to acquire a portion of that when it was abandoned. And it's now Chemistry Station Park that runs from Newton Street to Pine Street. I got the city to buy that. I pushed for the funds to build it. Um, this property surrounded by residences today, uh, it was slated to become a storage yard for construction equipment right in the middle of all these residences. Uh, and you can only imagine how that would have, uh, with uh, you know just the, the industrial nature of it and all the, uh, uh, the additional um, emissions from the heavy equipment, how that would have affected uh, you know, both the quality of life in the neighborhood and the and the um, the health of the residents. So uh, it's now an oasis of green in the middle of that residential neighborhood. When I left the council, I'd been working to acquire a vacant riverfront property at 67 Crescent Street. It's a property that is cited four times in the City of Waltham Master Plan as an important target for acquisition uh, for open space and increased public access to the Charles River. This property has been vacant, vacant for decades and it's been for sale for many years. If I'm returned to the Waltham City Council, I will renew my efforts to obtain that parcel as open space and to look for other opportunities to acquire land for open space on the south side because I think the south side really needs it. We need more open space and more trees. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Damon Doss. On the, yeah, always happy to talk about the South Side. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, we have a lack of green space. We have a lack of trees. Um, you know, I love hearing about the urban heat island effect. That's absolutely true. Um, you know, it is hotter on the South Side um, in those summer days than it is in North Waltham. Um, and being able to help cool the neighbors not only reduces, you know, energy costs, cooling costs, you know, but also keeps us all a bit more level headed. Um, you know, to have green space, we need trees. Um, and we need to have a tree ordinance. We need to have them protected in our zoning laws so that we can maintain green space and tree canopy during development. Um, I know there's a development going up across me. Um, they've been building for a few months and they've, they kept a birch tree right on the corner of the lot for months and months. Um, but only a week or so ago, I saw they ended up chopping it down. Um, I know McDonald Playground uh, up on Newton Street had uh, half a dozen big trees providing lots of shade to the playground and the sidewalk. Um, you know, but when we did those playground renovations, all those big trees came down. Um, so we really need to uh, preserve those resources when we have them um, and, and have something, uh, you know, in writing, in the law to protect those trees. You know, I also think about what space can we be converting from pavement to green space? Um, you know, those, you know, the parking lots for the watch factory um, there along Crescent Street, um, you know, are rarely full. Um, you know, what can we look for? Um, parking uh, restrictions, changing parking minimums so that, you know, we can be converting pavement to green space. Um, you know, the city bought that Bank of America building um, to turn it into parking. You know, could that have been better served as green space as a pocket park? Um, I know the city council looked into purchasing a pocket park um, back, I think, 2017 or so, but that, you know, that really hasn't played out. Um, I know other folks have mentioned sort of this tree planting program. I think that's underutilized and undercommunicated in the city. Um, so being able to communicate that to residents, you might have a good spot for a tree, um, you know, and, in, and increasing street trees um, are things we absolutely need in the South Side. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're up to question four. The river walk along the Charles River is a popular trail for residents and tourists alike, but some of the areas of the river walk are experiencing an increase in illicit activities. What is your vision for ensuring the safety of people who want to use Waltham's Riverwalk? And we'll start with Mr. Dawes. All right. Uh, so a, a lot of this comes down to a you know law enforcement jurisdiction problem. Um, you know that land belongs to D, uh, DCR, it belongs to the state. Um, you know, so Waltham uh, PD um, you know often won't patrol it. Um, I know, I think over the past summer, I, I saw an article saying, you know, Waltham along with Watertown and Newton um, 
uh, police departments are kind of working together um, to help patrol that. But I saw in my research, I saw another article from several years prior. Um, so this still is a continuing issue. Um, you know, one thing that this is a result of is, you know, there's a lack of lighting. Um, you know, this is a, uh, along the, the river walk is uh, natural, you know, it's not lit like it is like a street. Um, and, you know, we want to encourage folks who might be using that as a connection, you know, to go someplace safer and more well lit. So I think there's a lot of need for um, pedestrian improvements on Felton Street, on Crescent Street, on Felton, uh, on Calvary Street, um, some of the streets that parallel and that are, you know, are more appropriate to travel late at night. Um, I know that on, you know, sometimes on college campuses, you'll see sort of a you know, blue emergency beacon, you know, you know, being able to put these in our public places, you know, so that, that people, um, you know, who um, are uh, victims or who witness um, sort of any illicit activities can uh, call for help, um, you know, and sometimes illicit activities can be uh, as small as sort of littering, um, you know, making sure there's adequate trash cans along the river, um, you know, help keep it clean, uh, make it feel like a safer place, a more taken care of place. Um, so I think it really starts with uh, having a conversation with DCR. Um, I know that's been in talks, you know, it's something I'm going to do once I get into office, um, you know, to make sure that we have proper policing along that stretch, um, but also lots of safety improvements, you know, to make sure that folks who do want to make that travel, um, who do want to go along there at night, you know, have safer options. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Hanley. Yeah, thank you. I, I unfortunately I'm old enough to know that the Riverwalks had these kind of issues since it was built. Um, you know, definitely a bureaucratic nightmare to solve these issues when the state, DCR, city departments all have a part uh, to play in it. Um, I think Waltham could certainly increase police patrols on bicycles, the electric motorcycles, uh, foot patrols. Um, Waltham police, you know, know that area better than the state police. Um, even maybe plain plain clothes plain clothes patrols could help, um, and I, and and lighting cameras call boxes, um, you know these things exist on other uh, similar similar properties schools campuses. Um, again, I know it's difficult to implement with the state and city government relationships, um, and it's certainly uh, difficult to enforce a, a dusk till dawn use. Um, but I think one way we could maybe make some physical improvements, uh, cutting back vegetation and things that um, maybe give give some hiding places. Uh, we used to take advantage of the sheriff's um, work details uh, years ago when we had such a significant graffiti problem in that area. Um, I always thought that was an untapped uh, resource. I think that could help with landscaping, cleaning up trash, removing graffiti. Uh, and other uh, physical maintenance tasks that uh, could make sections of that Riverwalk safe to use. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Robert Davis. Uh, thank you again. Uh, yeah, the Riverwalk, again, being stated that it is state-owned, so it is kind of hard for us to really put a a real nail of how we're going to solve this problem again call boxes uh police details um all great great scenarios um that's what i i back behind that 100 percent uh the next one is going to be the rail trail that's going to be the next one that's going to have some issues with it and uh i think again lighting uh police details there's, there's going to be a lot that's going to be needed and hopefully we can work with the state the state can get involved some and see what they can come up with to, to help alleviate some of this problem that we're having um, again, the rail trail is going to be the second second issue that's going to come up soon. So once that project's completed through Waltham, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Mr. Book, Mr. McLaughlin. Thanks, Dan. Just trying to turn my camera on here. Um, so, um, the, the Riverwalk is a huge, huge asset to the city of Waltham. You look at, 
um, what the city of Boston over over many years has done with the Esplanade and um, the the Charles River frontage, both on the city of Boston side and also on the Cambridge side. It's a huge advantage to have that. And um, that being said, we, we've got some issues that need to be dealt with. It is true, DCR, uh, that's, their, that's their purview. I think, um, you know, I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks, my involvement with the Massachusetts Municipal Association. I served on that organization with Brian Arrigo, who's the former mayor of Revere. Um, Brian is now the DCR commissioner. So you've got a, a large city uh, similar to Waltham. Um, you've got leadership in the DCI that I think um, uh, is gonna be open to making some changes there. And I've already had initial conversations with um, former mayor, now Commissioner Arrigo, um, that would address some of these things. And um, and, and, and I'm looking forward to do, doing more work with him. Um, I think having more traffic down there, encouraging more traffic, um, um, traffic meaning um, um, pedestrians, uh, is going to help improve some of the problems down there, uh, in hand in hand with more um, law enforcement, and we you know we'd have to work that out with the DCR and how that would work uh, along with the Waltham Police Department, um, and then also it's been mentioned already, uh, lighting. That to me is the easiest fix right now. If we could get some money out of the state, that would improve lighting along um, along the the Riverwalk. Um, that would go a long way to address some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. That's up, Mr. Logan. Okay. <clears throat> so as everyone mentioned, it's uh, the uh, Riverwalk is owned by the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, the DCR, the state, not the city of Waltham. So we don't have the same control over it as we would say Prospect Hill Park. But that doesn't mean that we as a community can't push for improvements to be part of the solution. But I think it's important for people to understand that we don't have the level of control over the river walk that we do over city owned park. So we have to rely on the cooperation of the state agency. That being said, I was very happy to see this past summer during the warm months, uh, spring, summer into the fall, that there have been regular patrols of the river walk conducted jointly by the Mass State Police, the Waltham Police, and the Watertown Police. And I think it was very effective, and I hope that continues. Um, I noticed that the State Police patrolled on an ATV, and I thought that was a very good vehicle for that application. And I think if the Waltham Police uh, want one, that we should supply them with that, because I think that would be good, uh, not only on the Riverwalk, but maybe Prospect Hill Park and some other places. Uh, some of the problems along the Riverwalk are a result of the growing number of unhoused people in our community. So, you know, you can do all the enforcement you want, but until the housing crisis is addressed, the problems will continue to recur. Uh, meanwhile, any enforcement that takes place should be sensitive to the unfortunate circumstances of this vulnerable population. I want to note that uh, along the Riverwalk, at every place the Riverwalk crosses a street, there is a an RRFB, a rapid flashing rectangular beacon. I was the one that brought in the matter to the uh, the request of the traffic commission that led to RRFBs being uh, installed at every one of those crossings to make the river walk uh, safer. And finally, I'd just like to add that I'm a volunteer trail steward uh, and a scout leader. And I participated with members of Troop 250 Waltham and the Waltham Land Trust Earth Day cleanup along the Riverwalk the last few years. And we picked up a lot of trash and uh, lit us. So part of the solution with those, it lies with those who use the Riverwalk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on to question five. How should the city deal with the ongoing rat problem in a way that won't harm Waltham's wildlife? And we'll start with Mr. Logan. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, I just want to start out by saying I've checked with the city and they are not using the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides that are a danger to wildlife. So I think that's a, a first good step. The most effective way to reduce the rat population is to eliminate their food supplies. Take away the food and the rat population crashes. There are some steps the city can do, uh, can take in this direction. 
So first, I think all the open uh, top litter receptacles in our downtown sidewalks and in all our city parks, those should be replaced with big belly solar powered trash compactors or you know some other rodent proof receptacles. They keep the trash in and the rats out and they've proven to be quite effective in the other communities in reducing the rat population. So I think that that's one step that we can take. Uh, make the code enforcement officer in public works that handles trash violations 100% code enforcement. Currently, that position spends 50% of the time on other uh, DPW-related activities like uh, supervising uh, street paving. So I think uh, that position needs to be 100% code enforcement. I also think there should be a code enforcement officer devoted just to dumpsters. If you go all over the city, you see overflowing dumpsters that are just like rat buffets. So that has to be addressed. And finally, I led the charge uh, to get the blue recycling carts that everybody uses today. I brought in that resolution. It's time to have a discussion now about providing similar carts for trash. This would have to be implemented in a way to not negatively impact residents. You know, for example, free carts, extra carts, free pickup. Uh, but these are all real concrete solutions that can be readily implemented and will have a serious impact on the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Das. Thank you. Um, I, I went to a talk the Land Trust hosted uh, earlier in the spring about, um, you know, rat poison and the effects of the environment. Um, so it's definitely something I've been learning a lot more about uh, over this year. Um, I mean, I really see a kind of a five-step approach to this problem. Um, firstly, we, we have to get trash carts for, you know, everyone in the city. Um, you know, it, it, if you're a, a renter, you don't want to shell out the money for something, you might, for a, a place you may only be for a year. Um, you know, if it gets damaged, you know, are, are you out to fix it? Um, you know, we need sort of universal trash carts. And that also helps um, keeping uh, trash, a, a limit of how much trash you can throw out. Um, because in Waltham, you can really throw out whatever you want. Uh, there's no limit. Um, so I know that, you know, I talk with folks whose landlord may own a few properties in other cities and towns, you know, but will bring their trash to Waltham because they know that they can throw as much out as they want here. Um, so we need to have carts. We need to make sure that there's a limit on that trash. Um, you know, we need proper trash cans on Moody Street and our parks and our open spaces. Um, you know, there are some of those big bellies. I see them uh, by the senior apartments on Pine Street. I saw some at Gilmore Playground, um, but it's certainly not universal throughout the city. Um, and yeah, there, we need more code enforcement, you know, a properly funded health department, building department, CBW, um, you know, wherever those uh, fines and violations may exist, you know, both for residential and commercial. You know, for the rat traps themselves, um, you know, you get lots of landlords, especially here on the south side, who, you know, might not care about their properties as much. Um, so being able to have, you know, free rodent control um, and have those be, I've seen like smarter traps, you know, electronic traps, you know, that really help the city uh, pinpoint and identify where rats are at, how many are um, being caught. Um, that data is really helpful. Um, and also, as we talk about sort of getting rid of their food supply, you know, introducing municipal compost is a great way to get food waste out of the normal trash um, and can help kind of make that whole waste stream much cleaner. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Henley. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I think like any city our size, if we continually dig and build and grow our city, we're going to see rats. Um, they're part of the food chain, but nobody wants to see them. In all my time as a member of the Board of Health, we've discussed rat control. So it's it's been a long, a long time coming and it's gotten progressively worse. Um, I think a two-pronged approach with uh, innovative pest control and trash enforcement is key. Uh, I've even seen in my own neighborhood, people aren't leaving just their plastic bags of trash at the curb. Uh, with all our recycling and the blue bins, uh, we, we don't generate as much trash. Uh, I have a family of five and, and we don't generate a lot of trash. A ton of recycling, but not a lot of trash. So barrels with tight lids are becoming the norm. And I think that, that, that can make a difference. Uh, it just needs to continue citywide. I think we need to hold property owners accountable for how their tenants dispose of trash. I think that's that's a long time coming, commercial and residential. Uh, and and maybe it's even time to have a, 
uh, pest control specialist on the payroll. Uh, it, it's been a long time we've been talking about rats. We are now using contra pests, snap traps. Um, I like the use of dry ice in the burrows. Uh, there's a burrow RX product that can be used. We're using carbon monoxide to um, humanely kill the rats underground. Um, but again, I think we need to start dialing up the city's uh, role in controlling la rats all over the city in, in public and private property. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you again. Um, I've, as everybody else has already stated, I think uh, universal trash cans um, throughout the city, just like we have recycling cans, is going to be a good first step for the residential areas. Uh, commercially, where these big commercial buildings are coming in, they pay into a traffic commission to do traffic studies. I think these big commercial properties that are ripping down properties and, and disturbing, obviously, the rat population and having them scurry all over the place, I think they need to do an environmental study and put a fund in together for that to really start helping out with um, helping fund the city to take care of this problem and get, you know, trash trash containers to residents or, or vice versa. Another thing is these um, a lot of trash, open trash containers in the parks. Um, obviously, it's easier for uh, the CPW to get around and empty them out. But again, they're just wide open at the top. They're not they're not contained. Um, definitely have seen rats in some of our parks. Uh, and then the larger areas, um, we have to have a universal plan to, you know, outdoor dumpsters that need to be secure, self-closing, some way to keep the trash at bay and have a universal plan throughout the city. Again, a planning board would help. Uh, again, planning for the city, something needs to be done. The health department, CPW need to work together and really figure out a way to with the counselors and get a, get a plan together so we can uh, combat this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, thanks, Dan. So um, my fellow uh, participants have stolen all my thunder on this. Um, so um, I absolutely, um, we had a great um, um, dialogue back and forth about wildlife and uh, rat pesticides. And I think we're on the right track with that. Uh, we need to pay attention to what we're using um, so it doesn't harm uh, wildlife in Waltham and elsewhere. And I say elsewhere because Anyone that thinks the rat problem is a Waltham problem, it's not. It's a it's a city problem. Um, you see it in Watertown. You see it in Boston. You see it um, in Newton. Um, I think we've been aggressive at how we've addressed it, and we need to keep working the problem, uh, as I say. One of the things um, that I think is very important is with construction that goes on in Waltham, we have to make sure that those sites are pre-baited. Um, that will help reduce, uh, I believe, as much as the trash. Um, the, the trash issue, also important. I think it was a major, major win for the city that we went over to the, re the blue recycled barrels. That removed an enormous amount of trash uh, from the trash stream. Um, now the next step is gonna be to continue the enforcement uh, with people uh, not leaving tops off their bins on trash day, not putting bags on the ground. Um, that's uh, something else that's an enforcement um, um, issue. And I think uh, the city's also um, addressing that. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, so thank you so much for to all of our candidates. And if you care to come on uh, cam again, um, thank you to all of our candidates for uh, coming to tonight's uh, forum, and thank you to tonight's attendees uh, for uh, viewing tonight's um, forum. Uh, we hope you we hope you found this forum educational and insightful. Uh, the recording from all forums will be posted to the Waltham Land Trust as soon, uh, website as soon as we can. 
Uh, the written responses from candidates who could not make the forum will be posted alongside the videos. And please remember to vote on November 7th. You can also request mail-in ballots on the city website by October 31st, or vote early uh, on October 28th through the 30th at 260 Grove Street. Uh, also, please check out the website, uh, Waltham Land Trust website at walthamlandtrust.org for information about our events, including the Western Greenway 5K on uh, October 29th. Take a nice run through the woods of Beaverbrook, Beaverbrook North. Thank you for joining tonight's forum, everyone. Thank you to our candidates. Good night, everyone. <laughs>